Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. We are back um, with yet another aspect, a very important aspect of this Lohengrin production, and that is what happens in the pit, as it were. We have musicians. That part out. Not nearly enough. Mr. Lausemann, I would like to start with you because you have the only keyboard part in uh, the orchestra of Lohengrin, and it is an organ part, and I believe that the organ has just been newly refurbished, restored, um, and your part is unique, shall we say. That's right. <clears throat> First of all, I need to say that I have played this part in the past, but in this current series, my colleague Israel Gorski is in fact playing it in the performances. Um, yes, Lone Green has an organ part at the end of the second act. Of course, when Elsa and uh, Lone Green then go towards the church to get married. And um, opera and organs is one of my favorite topics, <laughs> as funny as it sounds, um, because uh, it's a very, very unique challenge um, to bring this instrument to an opera house, if you think about it. In a church, it's built in in the, in the back. You know, we're sitting in the, in, the, in the church, and it all makes sense. But in a theater, you have a proscenium, you have a backstage area, um, you know, you have a big auditorium. And if you think of the Met, well, where would the organ go? Um, the answer is that uh, when the Mets moved into the new theater in the 60s, um, they decided to uh, have one of the premier organ building companies at the time, Aeolian Skinner, design a completely bespoken and very, very interesting instrument that actually is housed in a large uh, sheet metal um, uh, enclosure backstage. So if you look at the proscenium from the auditorium, the organ lives to your right in the very back. Originally, it was actually designed to be on, on wheels. It actually still has wheels. Um, so you could actually wheel this enclosure, I'm thinking in meters. It's, I think, 12 meters high. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge thing um, that, if you look at it, it's just a big black box. And you know suddenly, it slats open, and you see it's an organ. Uh, it was designed to move around, so you can actually move it you know, to whatever side the organ at a church is supposed to be or you want the sound to come from. Um, unfortunately, they figured out that it's too heavy and that the backstage, the big stage wagons uh, where all the scenery lives on couldn't move with the organ on it. And since then, it has been banned to your right in the back, and that's where it's been ever since. <laughs> I have a, a, a couple of questions to ask you about this organ part, because it is very short. And it doesn't happen where one would expect it, knowing the wedding march in the third act. Um, what, is there a backstory about why he wrote the organ? Um, that's a really, really very, very good question. And I think I can only guess. Maybe somebody else knows the exact answer. I think it simply, at that moment, makes it abundantly clear that they will get married. Mm. It is not the actual, you know, church service where, you know, somebody would play the organ. It is simply, it brings, and that organ in, in, in operas is often used like that. It brings that quality into the, into the show. It's part of the orchestration, obviously. And I think Wagner simply chose to use an organ part because it made it very, very clear where this is heading. Now, at the actual ceremony, when they, when they um, you know, have the wedding that, you know, that's about to be taking place, the wedding music that we hear, the famous wedding march, da -dum -ba -dum, um, is actually played by a backstage orchestra. So there is no organ involved in that. My you know, amateurish opinion or idea always was that Wagner used this orchestration simply to show you know, that this is the moment microphones there here. This is the <laughs> moment um, where this is about um, to take place or where they decided to actually go through with it. And it's actually very luxurious to have a player just for such a short part. So from the alpha to the omega or vice versa, um, the bassoon part is incredibly long. And not at all luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an assistant? How do you get through? No, that's, that's, that's a really great question. Um, so for some operas, we do have, have assistants. Uh, Meistersinger, I think, would be virtually impossible to get through. Uh, without without assistant, um, and and for certain others, actually, interestingly, Elisir d'Amore. Mm. This year, for the first time, we have an assistant because 
two and a half hours into a two hour and 45 minute long opera, you have the defining bassoon solo in the entire repertoire. <laughs> um, cruel, after cruel. After playing almost, almost continuously. And, and the, the interesting thing about Wagner operas is, you know, I, I remember actually one of my, one of our uh, colleagues in the orchestra, Maron Kauri, our second flutist, he and I were in school together and he joined the Met Orchestra, I don't know, probably four or five years before, before I did. And, and I saw him uh, shortly after he got the job and I was sort of giving him a hard time saying, oh God, I, I can't imagine playing a Wagner opera. That must just be pure misery. <laughs> Little did you know. Because, you know, when you're, when you're in school, you're only really exposed to the preludes. Mm -hmm. You know, you play Meistersinger Prelude, you play Tannhäuser Prelude, and almost without exception, these are devastatingly exhausting. And then you think to yourself, okay, that was 10 minutes. What would I do for the next five hours and 50 minutes? Exactly. And, and come to find out that actually, once you get through those, you know, sort of exclusively orchestral bits, Wagner's actually rather good at pacing out the, 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 the writing uh, to sort of respect players' endurance. I mean, it's still a massive undertaking. I mean, I can still feel my face from yesterday afternoon. Um, but, you can't. You can't feel your face. Oh, no, I can feel it. <laughs> I can't. Um, but, but, but actually, I mean, they're, they're incredibly thoughtfully written, you know, to, to the point where, you know, at a time when virtually no one else was doing this, he would write, you know, sort of solo, solo or soli lines for the second and third bassoon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to give the first bassoon a break at, 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 at a time right. or, or, you know, vice versa. Um, and so while, yes, it's, it's a massive undertaking, um, almost mentally more than, more than physically, it is carefully paced out so that it's at least possible. Great. Well, I have to ask, in the clarinets, you enter after this long, um, long section in the solo strings in the prelude. And, um, of course, keeping pitch and having a different articulation, that must be challenging. He, you know, I, that is not as challenging. Can you all hear me? Maybe I should sit. Okay. Get up there. All right. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, the, the prelude, first of all, I just want to say that this is the second time I've played Lohengrin in my 22 years, but I also saw it the time before that as a student. Oh. And so I sort of have this uh, impression of what that is like, that shimmery sound that just comes from nowhere and just being like, what on earth is this? I mean, like, we just don't really study Wagner in in school at all. So to me, I, I already had this concept of of the overture. Um, so so that isn't as difficult as some of the the uh, sort of the wind uh, chorales in the second act, mm -hmm. um, which are much more difficult, uh, mostly because they modulate key. Right, all the characters have a specific key, and Elsa is E flat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> uh, so that is really difficult for for me, and I think for the winds, uh, everybody has a moving line, and but it's also the most satisfying mm. thing to really do. Or it's just the wind section, and we just really work to find our sound and how we breathe together, and. Uh, 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 every harmonic kind of chord where everybody needs to be, and I, that that is kind of amazing. The overture is amazing too. It's it's um, uh, the overture for us is about the expression of the da ya da. It's mm -hmm. that kind of rhythmic. Mm -hmm. So maybe not an articulation, but a sort of an emphasis. And Yannick really wants it a certain way. And which which is harder for us to do, I think. So we, we worked on that a lot. And speaking of key changes, is it the black forest next to you with an A and a B flat and an E flat? Or <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there's no no E flat in this, but we have bass clarinet mm -hmm. and then two clarinets, which is kind of unusual for Wagner. There's there's usually four of us. Mm -hmm. uh, no assistant. 
I don't think I would want an assistant, although I probably could use one, but the music <laughs> is so amazing, I don't know what I would sit out on. <laughs> um, but we have an assistant for a Dutchman, Flying Dutchman, um, and mm. Meister Singer, for mm. sure. I, and same thing, Gooder Dummerung is just on your six hours of playing, but it's just the most incredible playing. I, I don't know that, it, it, I think what Billy said is absolutely true. It's so well composed for our instrument. Mm. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, and, and this section and who he has playing at a certain time is really thoughtful. It's just... And, and what's so wonderful is that one moment you're playing in a chorale and, and another moment the melody just comes out of that, just right in the middle of this wonderful texture. Yeah, so I mean, for that, I think it takes the whole section to know who has the melody, how soft do we have to be for that to kind of emerge texturally um, and then bring out harmonic lines. So you, we, everybody really has to know their own role pretty intimately for this opera, I think, to work well. Same, and same thing through a brass. Almost like chamber music also. Mm -hmm. You have to really know everybody else's part as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Mr. Haheim, um, yeah. in the third act, you have quite a big solo, right? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Bing bong. Well, we do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a few of those, a few of those moments where you, it, it, I'm guessing some of you, many of you probably saw Lohengrin yeah. and the past six yes. shows out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you might have noticed some timpani every now and then, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> the timpani has no place to hide. It's not, and actually what's funny is I, I just heard Billy and Jess, dear friends of mine, eloquently describing how well composed the music is for their instrument, mm -hmm. and that's just absolutely not true, timpani. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do tell. No, not at all. Jason is always a font of positivity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, here's He's the trying. thing, like, I, I love, I, I really love getting in to these timpani parts in, in a deep way because they reveal Wagner not as this like god genius from on high Lohengrin style, but rather just a dude who was trying to figure it out, right? Like, <laughs> timpani and percussion for most of opera history up until then is a mess. It's just a mess. Like the orchestration standards were not like like at all consistent. Nowhere in my part is ever like the length of a note indicated. So from a very basic structural level, we have to do a lot to go in there and fix it and get it ready for a performance like yesterday. This is not Wagner's fault. It's just that he inherited this tradition that was kind of half-baked in, in Tiffany and Percussion Land. So that means that everything you guys heard, like 70% of that was what Wagner wrote. Hmm. And then the rest is just any timpanist you hear doing their best to get in there and try and fix and finish and, and make it like fully baked. It sounds like harpists. Yep. Har harpists are constantly having to uh, rewrite harp parts, yep. e even in very familiar solos. And uh, absolutely, of course, the twelve harps in Das Rheingold. Yep. Mm. Um, but do tell us that it's very interesting that you say that it is not idiomatically written for your instrument. A couple of questions come to mind: How many instruments, how many timpani was Wagner um, uh, stipulating in the orchestra? So Wagner basically spanned this time where it went from a couple trash cans with high and low boom. <laughs> Bing bong. Bing bong. <laughs> Kettle drum. To Strauss writing for five, six pedal timpani where you have the pedals to change the pitch on each drum rapidly should you need to. And Wagner was like just in the thick of this trying to figure out like, okay, what are the dudes in Munich doing? What are the dudes in Stuttgart? Like, so many dudes. So I, I mean, let's be real. It was all dudes. <laughs> um, but yeah, and they all, they all had like different makers they were working with and different mechanics. And so like he was a bit late to figuring this all out. So even through, I mean, you start off his first opera's unholy mess with the timpani part. Define. By the time you get to Parsifal, Good or Down, like the late operas, everything he was writing was intentional, but he still didn't know that you could have more than two timpani per player. And he didn't know that they would have pedals. And so he, like in all, like many of the famous solos in the ring cycle are actually written for a second timpanist mm. who's just sitting there next to you with two of their own drums. And so now with like modern orchestras and modern instruments, we, we consolidate that all to make it workable and not take up so much room in the small pits and all of this stuff. Um, 
Of course, but, you have a luxuriously large pit at the Met. Not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Never enough. <laughs> no. no, but so to answer your question, he, he basically he got to assuming two players, two instruments each, with screw mechanisms to change the pitch, mm. which you can do in like 20 or 30 seconds. And so you look through the part, and he, he starts to eventually design around those assumptions, mm -hmm. knowing that there's this harmonic importance to what's going on versus like Flying Dutchman, where it's just like two drums, no matter what the key, right? Mm. And calfskin heads, of course. <clears throat> Uh, yes, which further complicate matters. Absolutely. For those of you who are not in the timpani world, the head of the timpani, um, well, in lesser ensembles, is usually made of plastic, am I right? And uh, uh, in Germany, and I dare say at the Met, calfskin. Not really, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact climate change has made it impossible to use calfskin heads. Ah, oh, so tell, we tell switched us. a few years ago. Yeah, okay, yeah, because calfskin gives, I, I, as I understand it, a depth of sound that uh, can't be achieved any other way, but it's also a very fragile uh, material, and um, so... It, it breaks easily. It's very environmentally sensitive. But the nice thing is that actually plastic heads have come long away, like far enough along that in blind tests, most people, even timpanists, can't distinguish them anymore. So Have, have that's you ever good. had a head break during a performance? Calf head, yeah, oh yeah. What happened? Uh, I improvised. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's it's uh, it's not a fun experience. Mm. <laughs> Plus, there's a lot of conductors who have very specific ideas about how they want the timpani. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Lausemann, you wear many different hats at the Metropolitan Opera. Can you tell us a bit more about all of your various um, uh, functions at the Met? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, by training, I'm a pianist coach. So um, my role in many comp companies is called head of music. Um, and typically, uh, the person in that role is responsible for hiring and supervising the music staff. Those are the pianist coaches, assistant conductors, prompters, backstage conductors. Um, and then depending on the company, the role is defined um, also in, in various uh, other areas. Um, in my previous possession in Vienna and now here at the Met, uh, I am moreover responsible also for coordinating um, the various departments in the music department that is I'm involved with the orchestra very much, working with the orchestra manager, working with the chorus director, working with the music staff, working with the artistic administration. I am involved in long-term planning, short-term planning, uh, daily schedule. I am the direct contact with all the conductors, uh, that is our music director, of course, but all the guest conductors, um, and then coordinate um, whatever their artistic desires and ideas are, and making sure that on the Met side, um, we keep to our budgets, that rehearsals are professionally run. Um, I uh, help uh, schedule the breaks, uh, which is quite complicated. Um, if you have a large stage rehearsal uh, that involves the orchestra, the chorus, the music staff, and then all the production departments, so the stage technicians, stage managers, uh, directors, assistant directors, uh, actors, dancers, and, and all those groups are union employees with uh, differing union contracts. Um, so it's, you know, I always feel it's a little bit... Yeah, it's not a game for sure, but it's like a little bit playing like Sudoku or crossword. Um, you kind of need to really figure out what you want to achieve in that rehearsal and then make the best guess uh, how you can achieve that um, by coordinating all the various groups. Um, obviously, everything then, you know, develops completely different when you're actually in the rehearsal. And um, one of my uh, fondest roles is uh, that I'm responsible to the general manager. If something changes in rehearsal and we need to extend it, I need to be able to calculate within like you know two minutes and 30 seconds how much that's going to cost him. Um, and <laughs> then, you know, uh, this kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's a various, uh, it's always related to artistic and musical matters. Um, but at the same time, there's also a large administrative component to it, and it's working with a lot of different people, which I very much enjoy. So you're kind of largo al factotum, right? You're well, you know, I come to work in the morning, and then life happens, and then I go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I also want to, at this point, sing the praises of the musical coach, because that is a job that is probably one of the most complicated and challenging roles in an opera company. A musical coach, first of all, of course, has to know all the music inside out, has to be able to be an, uh, a superb um, pianist, has to know languages, has to be able to sing and play simultaneously, has to be able to sing and play and correct singers simultaneously. It's really um, just a multifaceted job. And uh, bravo to, uh, to you and to all people who coach. I have uh, tremendous admiration. Thank you. I want to ask you about the clarinet part in Lohengrin as opposed to the clarinet parts in later Wagner operas, because we have, we have heard about the timpani part and how Wagner changed and evolved. And of course, this is not you know, the late Wagner. This is the middle Wagner. And I know you've played all of, all of the repertory, so uh, I'm sure you have a good uh, vantage point to speak about where this fits and how he, how he evolved. That's a great question. You know, thank you. <laughs> it, this is this is uh, my first time playing principal clarinet on Lone Grand. The last time I played it, I played second, and so, um, and I played principal and second on all of the Ring, and I guess Flying Dutchman now and Percival. I've not played principal on. Um, I think that. What happens, and Tomas will correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, um, in Lohengrin, the clarinet and the oboe trade off the solo lines a lot, um, not particularly with the flute, necessarily. Mm -hmm. So there, and I think that Wagner um, really hears the oboe and the clarinet as like a human voice, a uh, lyrical um, line. And so he's not really writing necessarily a light motif for it. It's we're in the key and that's the character and he's and there's like a beautiful melody. I mean it's sort of light motif but not so much. But then later in in uh, in the ring or Gooder Dumberung in particular, uh, the clarinet has all the light motifs of of you know um, you know the all the uh, Brunhilde and her waking up and many different things um, and the earlier Wagner I find is more chordal. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're kind of like, you know, there's what I call the clarobo, which just goes bang, and that's that, you know? And so there's a lot of that. Accurate. <laughs> Accurate, yeah, it's just like oh. um, Which it, it's kind of interesting. I, I think one of the things that the Met Orchestra, I, I, I will say maybe as the senior member here, I think we do Wagner probably the best of anything uh, that we do. Uh, and, and I think that's because we just have a certain way, like if you hear the strings and like, you know, rah, there's a lot of aggression and then absolute just soft Elsa's, you know, cheek. And I think we do that so well, that extreme, um, we have the capacity for it and we have the athleticism for it. And uh, so um, for me, Lohengrin is, building up to that athleticism of the ring. Gutter Damerung is six hours. We play the entire time. He writes for trio clarinet. That kind of opens act three, um, all kinds of solos. The, the longest I've ever played in one day was Gutter Damerung and Carmelites. And I went home, and my husband went to kiss me, and I was like, don't touch, no, no, don't, don't even come near me. I can't feel my face. But I had to do both of them, and, you know, maybe a bad idea. Uh, but there is something about that kind of lyricism that the clarinet has, and then uh, that kind of, like, brassy, you know, really aggressive uh, kind of, uh, like the funeral march, you know, where maybe you're not really hearing us specifically, but we are playing exactly what the brass have. So we're sort of filling that out with the depth of, of flavor, if you will. So I kind of like the both of those. Mm -hmm. And Lohengrin is the first time he starts to write like that, mm. I think, for, for, for clarinet in particular. 
And you also have endless Is that very tiring? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, my favorite part of rehearsal was when Yannick says, it really should be faster than you can play it. <laughs> I think you missed that day. Where, because she is so angry. Yeah, he missed every day. Um, she is so angry, and it's the first time Elsa is speaking out for herself. So he wants her to feel out of breath. And so we are literally out of breath, mm. too. Um, but he wanted that sort of frantic feeling to that moment the first time she really speaks out um, and, and speaks up for herself. And the prelude to Act Three, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. endless, endless. Yeah. Speaking of which, in the bassoon, endless, endless. And um, yeah, bassoon parts, um, bassoon very often is, is coupled with the horn. Um, and I know later Wagner does this a great deal. Um, do you feel there's a difference in Lohengrin? Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a great question. Um, first, for the record, I am personally coupled with horn. My wife is a hornet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 and certainly, I mean, there are some just amazingly satisfying moments throughout Wagner's writing. For, for bassoons and, and horns, you know the the prelude to, to Act Three of Meistersinger mm. leaps to mind that glorious chorale that you know often the hornists are unaware that the second bassoon is actually their bass voice. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I remember I, I was actually first introduced to that particular passage um, through an audition list, mm. the the a, a second bassoon audition that I took actually the week before um, I won my job at, at the at the Met had the prelude to act three of, mm. of Meistersinger on it. And it's just the most spectacular, juicy, really dig in and, um, and just sort of enjoy this incredible contrapuntal writing. Um, and you know, in, in Lohengrin, you know, you have these, these moments similar to what Jess was talking about. Um, where you know the prelude to Act Three of Lohengrin, where we're doubling all of the yo ta ta ti dum ba dum ba dum pi di dum, um, which which you know I, I think in that particular moment you know because it's it's you know three bassoons against four much louder horns and <laughs> and, and you know some even louder low brass you know I, I think that it's it's less about us actually filling out their sound and it's more about you know something that I've I've spoken with. Uh, composers about before, which is this idea of sort of, you know, the the string unit, the woodwind unit, the, the, the brass unit, and each of those individually being balanced, even if you can't immediately hear every voice uh, in, the, in the final unit, that that itself sort of fills out the sound of the orchestra as, as a whole. Uh, now, I mean, in terms of sort of pairing bassoons and, and horns in general. I mean, I just think that, that they are, they're instruments that just match very naturally and, and, yes. and you know, easily is probably the wrong word, but easily. You know, just the, with the, good the players. Colors. Yeah, well, the, 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 the colors, they, they, they really complement one mm -hmm. another beautifully. And I think certainly, you know, Wagner had, had found that and was taking advantage of that. Uh, in, in Lohengrin, you know, it, it does feel like a, an appropriate place to mention, you know, between Jess alluding to the fact that I was absent on this particular day of, of rehearsal when Yannick asked for something faster than was physically possible. Um, was that on purpose? That, <laughs> aggressively, no. He was warned. So, so, so I did not play a single rehearsal of Lohengrin this year because I had COVID. Um, and, and that was really fun because, because, you know, there's, there's, there's this sort of understanding, um, when you're a student sort of embarking on the orchestral audition path that, you know, if you are one of the, you know, fortunate chosen few to actually find yourself in a full-time position, that your responsibility is then to be so prepared, you show up, you know every single note of your part, you know every single note of everyone else's part, mm -hmm. there is no excuse for, for anything less. Um, those people, with all due respect, have never played opera for a living. <laughs> because, Indeed. because, you know, Lohengrin is, is, is one thing. To, to me, Parsifal is to an even greater degree something that you can prepare it as much as humanly possible. You can listen to it, you can study it, you can mark up the part, you can have the score 
there open right beside you, you will arrive at the third performance, turn the page in hour six, and say, I've never seen any of these notes before in my life. <laughs> Very true. It's, yeah. it's, totally just, true. it's just too much music to keep inside your head all at once without having actually physically done it numerous times. So, so you know, I have to admit, um, prior to, you know, actually playing, finally, a, a couple of Lohengrins in performance, you know, I would still have moments, despite the fact that I observed rehearsals when I was pre-rebound, despite the fact that, that, you know, I had studied it, I had practiced it, that I would still, you know, play a given note and say, oh, that's interesting, that's with the horns, apparently. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's a really fascinating sort of mentality in performance that, that just requires, I mean, just a different level of focus from anything else I've, I've ever done. And, and Jason can, can speak to this also, because we've talked, Jason is a recovering nanoscientist and, <laughs> and, and, and has, has mentioned the same thing to me, that, that, that playing opera for a living requires a degree of focus um, that, that I, I, not to put words in your mouth, but has, has, you, you had never really experienced prior to, to joining the orchestra. Yeah, totally true. I mean, I, I can't think of anything else that is simultaneously as physically and mentally demanding for that long. Period. Like, in the world. So, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like playing in a Broadway pit where you can have a sub come in at the last minute and play your part. This doesn't happen. <laughs> no. Well, and I mean, when I was in grad school, I, I had, you had to pass my PhD qualifying exams, right? So I had a bunch of, like, you know, quantum physics nerds asking me to go up to a whiteboard and just derive stuff from scratch for, like, two hours. And I was like... Okay, that was fine. And then I started playing Wagner operas. So I was like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so to your point, Billy. T tell us a little bit more about your scientific work, because I know you have degrees in what electrical engineering and uh, various other intimidating yeah. scientific. Yeah, so physics and electrical engineering. And um, right, I think, I think most people would assume that these are very, very like different facets of my life, and I've just never experienced them that way. You know, like they're, they're both extremely process oriented in the sense that like the goal of doing physics homework is not to get the right answer. It's to learn how to think about problem solving. Hmm. And I would argue that the goal of what we do is, yeah, there's going to be a performance that comes out at the end of it. But in order to get through this, to do the kind of stuff that Billy and Jess and Tomas have been talking about, like you have to have a good process for it. You have to know how to prepare. You have to know how to prepare within your physical and mental limits. You have to be really good at rationing your concentration and energy and emotional energy. Like one of the things I think about actually even yesterday during the HD is it's incredibly beautiful and overwhelming and we can't let ourselves get too far into it, mm. right? If you get swept away, you miss an entrance. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying with timpani, like that would be a problem, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is true because I got a little choked up during the, the, the one of the Elsa's moments like is I actually just thought it was probably one of the best uh wind moments like that I've heard in my career at the mm. Met and I was like oh my oh god don't don't if your nose starts running it's over you know <laughs> then it's gonna ruin everything can't cry that's, and play that's gonna be the title of Jessica's memoir <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing that I wanted to say about the difference between the Met Orchestra and um, a, 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 let's say, the New York Philharmonic is that you are part of the vocal uh, production of this as well. And I'm sure that listening to the singers as carefully as you all have to do must make a difference in the way you color your sound and the dynamics and in, in many aspects of it. I wonder if you would, each one of you, address that. I'm, I mean, ab absolutely. I, I, I would say I'm, I'm happy to jump on that. Um, I think the reason why um, the Met Orchestra in particular is incredibly flexible um, is because we're always listening to that voice, right? So we can hear somebody breathe. I, you know, I've seen singers skip a beat and us all go and, you know, just go right with it. Um, and there's, there's something about breathing, the human voice like can't, 
just sustain for although uh, you know the father in La Traviata can he can sustain sustain forever. <laughs> it's wonderful, um, but there there is something about the the breath and the 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 tone quality that I think, especially for you know when we think about Wagnerian voices that uh, we're trying to echo. I also tell everybody there is never a dull moment in opera. There's always something wonderful happening, and I don't know. Uh, at the Philharmonic, I'm sure there is, but it seems a bit snoozy to me <laughs> compared to everything that's happening for us on stage. Um, I guess I'll stop there. And, and, I, and, yeah, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, but clarinet and bassoon also are within the human singing range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe Absolutely. the timpani is too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a joke. Bing bong. <laughs> Bing bong. <laughs> no, to, 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 to piggyback on, on what, what Jess just said, I, I remember my first season playing Parsifal which, as I'm sure many of you um, recall, the, the, the current production, also by Francois Girard, um, in the second act, the stage is flooded with fake blood. And at the end of act two, in one of our later performances in this run, you know, we get to the end of act two, we're all exhausted, we have another act to play, we sort of trudge out of the pit into the men's locker room. And apparently they had sprung a leak somewhere upstairs <laughs> because there was fake blood streaming down the walls oh of the men's locker room. And, and, and I just remember thinking, I doubt that this happens at the filler <laughs> but, but, you know, but on, on a... That's sort great. of, uh, sort of uh, on, but on, on a, on a, on a ver very different note, um, you know, what, what you said is, is so true. And, and honestly, I, I think the extent to which being exposed night after night to the greatest voices in the world influences our playing and our relationship to music. I, I, I honestly think that, that we're probably not even aware of, of, mm -hmm. of the, the full extent of its influence. But, but one very tangible memory that I have is you know, I, every, everyone has different musical values. There is, there is nothing inherently wrong with that um, at all. But, you know, for, for me, one of, one of my values that I strive for is having the, the widest possible uh, expressive range, which carries with it certain challenges, both in my own playing and in, and in my teaching. And I was having this sort of, you know, crisis of confidence. Hmm. One, one evening that, you know, is, is it really that important? Because it would be a whole lot easier to just go for pretty all the time, not go to those, you know, extremes dynamically, coloristically, character-wise. You know, is it really worth all of that? And, 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 I, and I remember that night was a performance of Agrippina, um, which has an extremely sparse bassoon part, but I just treasured getting to sit in the pit and listen to this mm. glorious music. And, and I remember hearing Joyce D. Donato that mm. evening come, come on stage and start singing and do what I aspire to mm. do as, as a musician. And in the midst of this crisis of confidence thinking, no, that's, mm. that's, that's why this is important mm. to me. And, and, and that was a, a really, heartening and, and defining moment for me that, that I don't know that I would have had without this relationship with voices that we're all so fortunate to, to develop. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us, wow. Yeah, it's great, and I'm gonna go a lot less profound on this. <laughs> and just take what you were saying about the expressive range, which mm -hmm. I agree with, and you know, in my, in my teaching, even before the Met, I think I would sometimes struggle to communicate this with students, because um, they're, Expressive range was like, well, it's loud, and then it's louder, right? And they're drummers, so. And especially when it came to color, right? Like, I yeah. think, I think it's, it's not natural for percussionists who start playing timpani to have these kinds of values, like, just baked in, right? A lot, a lot of kids are gonna start on, like, snare drum, or a little drum pad, and they're like, ta ka 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 and it's, it's so, so their musical conception is primarily rhythmic. It's not wrong, it's just, a certain order of priority. And after getting to the Met, I was kind of like, wait, I have like a totally different way I can help students think about this on timpani. Think, just think about consonants and vowels, right? Mm -hmm. think, about, think about an attack that can range 
from a sort of like ka to a ba to a ma. Mm. And then think of a sustain that can range from a, an e or an a or an o or an u. And think about how those colors fit different dramatic situations. Because, again, in quite different ways than most symphonic repertoire, like timpani are always involved in these peak dramatic moments. Mm -hmm. Like, as you guys heard yesterday or any of the previous shows, like, this is one of Wagner's fundamental innovations. And it could be an I love you, it could be an I hate you, it could be... One of the things I always think about, like, especially Lohengrin, Gutter Dammerung, like, timpani come in when the, the mood on the stage is just like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Da 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 damn. <laughs> right? And, and like what what should that sound like? I always wondered what that was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's and, it. And and you have the tools to do that with many things. First of all, your brain and your ear, but also sticks, tempo, um, the speed of articulation. Right, um, right. It's it's this whole it's this whole palette or a, a quiver, right? It's like you've got you've got eight or nine different variables you can play around with. But to start, like, I want to get my students realizing that those variables exist. Mm. And then have an opinion about them, you know? It's true. I think it's really hard to marry emotion, like what's happening on stage, with sound, like our, the way we make our music instrumentally. And the, the, the clearest example I can give you is playing Faust with Yannick again. And he, there's a little clarinet cadenza, and he stops, and he goes, no, 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 no. Uh, it's too happy. You're just the happy girl. I see you're always smiling. This is, you can't be like that at all. It's just no joy. This is despair, you know? And I went, how the f did you do that? I just didn't. And so it took me a while to kind of figure out, oh, like, color and mm. airspeed and the, actually the temperature of the air that mm. I use. And so it's the same kind of thing. And most clarinet players are not thinking about that either. So I, I do think it's, there is something about the drama in addition to the human voice mm -hmm. that we're also kind of taking mm. into consideration. I mean, for me, um, that's what drew me to opera in the first place. Um, I was a pianist and I hated being alone, so that, you know, that wasn't for me then. And um, played a lot of chamber music and started playing for vocal studios. And I've, that moment where suddenly language, a story, um, theater, a dramatic purpose came into this music making, that's where I knew that's, that's really interesting to me. That gives my job as a musician a true purpose to translate, you know, my my abilities to play music into a theatrical experience, and clearly, any music has that inherently. You know, a Beethoven symphony is highly dramatic and also theatrical music. Except in opera, you can't. There's no way to ignore it. You know, you are you are part of the story, and you know, anything we play has a purpose, and that's to me, you know, like. Yeah, the, the, this Lone Green performances, really every moment ties into the storytelling and ties into what the singers are doing. And that to me is incredibly meaningful. Now, you have had the wonderful opportunity to play chamber music with these notable musicians. Uh, what is that like? Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, that's the moment where you can suddenly, um, you know, I don't have to worry about break rules, um, you know, <laughs> over time, you know, days off. Um, and uh, I, I can f <laughs> just simply focus um, making music with an amazing colleagues. Uh, to me, that's a, that's a great gift. So, yeah, I very much enjoyed it. And you've done that all over the world, right? You've done that not only here uh, with the Metropolitan Opera musicians, but I believe in Vienna also. And that, that's right. I mean, the, the advantage if you're a musician at an opera company is that there's always opportunity to do things, you know, to play a to vocal recital, a leader abend, uh, or to play chamber music with orchestra musicians. Or for me, which is kind of my uh, secret, my uh, favorite hobby is to play uh, keyboards in an orchestra. Um, yeah, that's a that's a true gift um, mm -hmm. as a as a pianist to be in an environment uh, where we can do so many different things. And um, recitatives yeah. on harpsichord. 
Absolutely. I really enjoy that. Yeah. Do you improvise? Say it one more time. Improvise on a harpsichord. Uh, you probably don't want to hear too much of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm very good playing with everybody else. <laughs> Tomas came in at the last minute for the glockenspiel on Die Zauberflot. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And Billy and I were sitting behind him, oh. and he has the most wonderful flourish <laughs> at the end. <laughs> and, and we were like... <laughs> well, it's, it's theatrical it, it after was, all, isn't it? Was. It? Yeah. it was so wonderful. And I don't think we've ever had anybody... Uh, I, I, it, Tomas is the first uh, artistic administrator mm -hmm. who actually comes and sits in the pit. So it's a, really a wonderful bridge um, to have that, to be able to make music like that, I think. It's, really it's great incredible. for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now, you all are so incredibly busy. I would like to know what you do for leisure. <laughs> Let's start with you, Billy. Boy. <laughs> um, boy, what do I do for me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm remembering the last five weeks of COVID followed by a cold followed by the flu. Um, so lying in bed a lot apparently is one of my favorite activities. But, but no, um, my, my, my wife and I uh, are uh, shall we say, food enthusiasts? Mm. Um, it, it it always feels a, a little bit um, a little bit much to call ourselves foodies, but uh, but she's uh, an absolutely amazing cook, as as my my friends here can can uh, attest. Um, I'm an, I'm much more of an enthusiastic eater. She she tries <laughs> desperately to teach me how to cook. Um, and you know, I, I'm someone for whom arbitrary things just don't stick in my brain, <laughs> and so and so she'll she'll tell me you're you're going to help me cook the dinner tonight, and we'll be we'll be going along, and, and she'll say okay now put it in the oven you know for for 30 minutes at 350, and I'll say why, <laughs> why 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 not 400 for 20 minutes? Why not 300? Billy's for, not for, very for, bright, for you guys. Yes. <laughs> and and usually the answer is, would you please just shut up and do it? <laughs> why should I playing this part? You know, yeah. you know, just follow orders, Billy. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm 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 an aspiring watch enthusiast. Um, it's there's there's something just very sort of pristine and controlled and sort of as close to perfection ah. as as humanity can produce. That's very opposite from the incredibly wonderful but ultimately transient nature of making music for a living. However, yes. it does relate to making reads. It does relate to making reads, which I would not <laughs> call one of my favorite leisure activities. Although I'll, I'm happy to discuss that. Also, uh, she, uh, my my wife, got me a couple of watch movements along with disassembly and reassembly mm. instructions recently that I've been futzing around with. So I, I guess I guess we find a, a occasional fun things to do in the midst of playing and teaching and making reads. So Great. So Jess, how about you? <laughs> um, uh, OK, yeah. You realize everybody has to wait <laughs> to think about leisure. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I am uh, in my gigantic amount of spare time uh, working on an MBA in mm. arts entrepreneurship. Um, and it's really uh, fascinating, actually. Um, and so I am doing a lot of that in my spare time right now. Um, and I love mystery novels. I just can't. That's, I'll stay up until 3 a.m. reading that. So uh, those are my two, two things right now. And uh, yes, uh, so Jason. When, when not in the pit and when not preparing Wagner opportunity parts, um, my partner and I love to strap backpacks on mm -hmm. that weigh about 40 pounds with everything we need in it and go hike into the mountains for oh. weeks at a time. Great. And it's just, I, I find it to be weirdly a very similar experience to if you're in our four and a half of Lohengrin, where like we don't, we don't have the luxury to really be thinking too much, right? Like you have to be very present focused and engaged and aware, but just like get rid of the chattering, get rid of the, the voices and the anxieties and the stresses and the questions, just all, just, just, just be there. And that's like what being out in nature can do for me, at least. It's just, you're, you have nowhere else to be, nothing else to do. Turn off the phone, just look around. Wonderful. So that's what we do. Wonderful. Yeah, Thomas. Well, there must be a strong tie between music and food because I also <laughs> love to cook. Um, and that's, for me, very, very relaxing. I love it. Uh, my wife is a great baker, so she lets me cook and she bakes. 
good combination. Great. Well, I think we are just about at the witching hour, so I would like to thank all of you so much for sharing your insights.